Aloha. I'm Marcia Joyner, and we are navigating the journey. This is a really special journey because we are going to venture into the world of the silver tsunami. You know Hawaii is the ideal place for people to retire. And so today we are going to look at the different programs and projects designed for seniors or the silver tsunami. And my guest today is Ken Farm, and he's the chair of the neighborhood board number 15, Kalihi Palama. And he, his expertise, I guess, is dealing with people. <laughs> and, and he knows most of the programs and, pro, and within the state and the city and county that deal with these issues. And um, being a, a, well, no, I'm not a baby boomer. I was born before the baby boomers. Anyway, uh, the baby boomer generation are the people born between 1946 and 1964. And between now and 2030, 10,000 baby boomers each day will hit retirement age. Can you imagine that? 10,000 a day. So today we are going to look at that problems and all of the different issues related to the silver tsunami. Aloha, Ken, and welcome. Aloha, welcome, how welcome are you, Marcia? To and welcome to Think Tech's uh, final days in that studio. This is an really nice uh, Think studio. Think Tech is moving to a new to a new facility, and so enjoy that last day there. I, I will. I will. This is a really nice studio, and uh, it will be missed. <laughs> yes. So, so let's talk about the silver tsunami about se seniors. Well, first of all, before we do that, tell us about Ken. Everybody so, knows Ken Farm. Well, that's much appreciated, and, Marcia. Thank but, you. Well, let me <laughs> let me say this. Let me say this. He's a dear friend, and his name is Kendrick Farm, and he Not is longer, Hawaiian. But... So he has he has it's a great Hawaiian name, Kendrick Farm. But he does have a middle name, and it has every letter in the Hawaiian alphabet three times. Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> this, that long. <laughs> so, I just shared it because it's easier for more people to, you know, it, you know, it's, it's easier easy. to I just put say. Can. Just put three right. things, yeah, right. Um, yeah. So, <laughs> what I also want to say okay. too is, I, you know, I am not, you know, the so-called expert when it comes to some of these programs. I mean, I try to become that expert when it comes to my community because I have a lot of people who are seniors, and the reason being is because, you know. Yeah, as you mentioned it before, we're looking at the silver tsunami. And one of the issues is, is that as these people start to get older, um, the more and more that there is a need for different services or uh, a pressing on the services that are currently available. So it's important that people get into the right services in the right areas so that way um, they don't fall through the cracks. And one of the things that I've noticed, unfortunately, and I hate bringing up homelessness on this, is but I've seen a lot more seniors that are homeless. And the reason that they're homeless is for the fact that for some of them is because they're on a fixed income and sometimes they, you know, there might be medicines or, or, or forms of medical care that they just can't afford uh, where they could have had different services if they knew about it uh, and that outreach was there. And I think that that's very important, I think, throughout the, you know, the gamut of this entire show to talk about. The, uh, well, let's talk about outreach and do we have in... I, I mean, on paper, we had this lovely little handbook for seniors, but when they get there, when they call them, do they really get the kind of services they need? Um, you know, so many, like you said, so many seniors have multiple, multiple uh, prescriptions. And then they have this strange, uh, what am I saying, effect of one medicine on the other. Do they? know where to go do they know how to get uh help for this kind of thing so that's that's where, where do we go how do we go? and especially like you said in your neighborhood because it's an old neighborhood it's one of the first neighborhoods on the island of oahu 
So you have lots of people that have lived there for generations. What is there? Do they get the care? Do they know how to go to get what they need? So I think, you know, this is something that we have to unpack. I think that there's who, who actually do get the services that, you know, that are, they're looking for. But there's also those who, you know, may not have that level of support that the others had in order to get that the care that, they, you know, they have available. One of the things, you know, that the state offers is this program called SHIP. Now, that is an okay program. We have people who are volunteering their time, which is very commendable, to help individuals. But it mostly helps with them looking at it from a cost how much is it going to cost, which is going to be cheaper. And in some cases, that's very important. We're looking at affordability. But the other thing, too, is, is that is it going to be the, the right level of care and the need that that individual has uh, for their, you know, their lifestyle, things that they've had to come up with? And that takes a little bit more of, of education when it comes to their. And plus, you know, we talk about services and the amount of pressure on them because of many people calling. So, for example, a ship, there's some people who've waited you know, almost a week or so for different answers. And this is just the beginning. As we start looking at more of the seniors and, and the issues that are coming up, you know, as they're on fixed income and so on and so forth, um, we're going to see a, a need much more than what we have now. So it's, it's better that we get prepared. It's better that we look at the reality of where it is. And also is, you know, we have certain things that are going on that are showing that if we don't do this correctly, we're going to have more people on the street. So, for example, the more that we see seniors on the street, that has something to do with fixed income. But w what are some of the things that could have prevented that, right? You know, for some cases, there's mental health issues that some have suffered before. But when we have seniors who lived in apartments, for example, and now because of fixed income, they're not able to afford living in those areas, um, what is it there for them? You know, uh, if you have a person who's just on the street, for example, that's... Uh, for them, that, that's trauma enough. Then you have a senior, right? And the issues that they have and, and all the things that are going on. I mean, these are the kind of the hard issues that we're going to have to talk about. It, it's easy to put people in, in little boxes here and there, but every you know, types of case is separate. And then furthermore, we have to ask the overlying questions, well, why is this happening? And along with that is what are the support services available so that we make sure that you know, they get the right information. And you know, I just was at a person who I know personally, uh, she does very good work, her name is Martha, and we talk about some of these things with people who have no idea. For example, um, you know, uh, July 1st is coming up, and if you don't uh, have the, the new Medicare card, for example, um, that doesn't have your social security number and, and doesn't have the signature, just has that 11 digit uh, code or whatever it's on there, uh, then you may not get the services that you have. So even if you have that, uh, it's important to look at some of those things and do our seniors have that? Do they know that? Do, do our seniors speak uh, something other than English? What's that outreach when it comes to that community? We have a lot of people, for example, in my community have about close to 43,000, and some of them English is a second language, and we have to consider that when we look at these different types of services. Well, speaking of services, in uh, how large is your area? So the area that I have... Uh, no, I mean, in, in Kalihi Palama, how, how large an area are we talking about? I wish I had a visual I, I just to show you. <laughs> so um, <laughs> if we take no. from the river, basically from Chinatown, where that river is in the Uanu stream, go right. up a school street and go all the way around, past Helena's, you know, past Lanakila housing, where there's a lot of seniors there, keep going around where KPT is, and down to, to Middle Street, Everything below there, uh, Sand Island. So I have, you know, this is Kalihi Palama on there, but, you know, what's, what is more of reality is I have Kalihi Palama, I have Aala, I have uh, Ivalay, and Sand Island. And all those areas combined is, is what that is. And that's a very large area to begin with. And then you have a population of 43,000. Um, that is something that, you know, even as a volunteer, if you will, when it comes to capacity on the neighborhood board, that's a lot to deal with. And, you know, it's when you can find those different types of things, like I, I try to make it where my board, you know, I try to let my board members know that I try to find these different outreach vehicles. So even if we've heard of it, and I call it the bubble of people who kind of know these different services, that people outside of that get acquainted with those services and maybe they qualify for it, maybe they don't. At least they know these other things are available. So should they have somebody else, maybe they qualify for it. And I think that those things are important to look at. Well, now, do you have an area that large, are there of physical 
like um, clinics and uh, I guess that for people, uh, the little clinics, the urgent care, uh, the big ones, how far is it to uh, Queens or Kaiser or any of those? And, and urgent care, people where they can physically go and be cared for. Are they close? Are there any of those close? Dennis, uh, what about di dialysis? You know, that's a big thing with, and they say Hawaii leads the nation in kidney issues. Do you have dialysis in that area? That is huge, huge, huge. So, you know, I mean, are, are those facilities there aside from seniors, you know, you know, which is we're talking about. And I think that when we look at dialysis, that's something that um, as sad as it sounds, it is something that is beyond just the senior population. We have people who are younger who, who uh, rely on that in order to survive. And we we don't have it within the district as far as I understand. But I think it's something that as we look at TOD, as we look at, you know, the, the zoning for mixed commercial residential, but it's something that we should take a look at and how do we make sure that we have those services close to those areas as you know the population grows so i think that that's something that definitely needs to be talked about if it hasn't i think that we do have you know to answer your question about different types of medical care we have you know kalihi palama health uh, center and they have their clinics there uh, but they're also you know dealing with other pro uh, situations and other pro problems so they're you know to capacity we have uh, KKV, which is Kukulkalihi Valley. It's another very important, vital component to the uh, healthcare aspect of our community. Those are the two off, uh, that I can think of off uh, my mind, but all these things combined are important. And as that population grows and as there's a more need for services, we're gonna need to ask ourselves questions, you know, such as, you know, what else are we gonna need? Right now we have, for example, um, we talked about, you know, people who are on the street, hygiene center. Just that alone is important because anything that is preventive in healthcare is going to be cheaper in the long run than trying to get some money from the ambulance to emergency room care, which is one of the most exp uh, expensive forms of care that there is. So the more that we can look oh, at yes. the preventive ambulances, side, what is it? Ambulance costs what twelve hundred dollars? I think the last like I saw was about eighteen hundred and fifty dollars for an ambulance oh. ride, and oh. I believe that emergency room care. If I remember correctly, it was close to $3,500. So you combine both of those together, just one time for one person, uh, and that adds up. So let's say if we did that for one person per month, we're looking at close to $64,000. Um, so it's, it's important to have that preventive care so that we're saving money on that end so that we can put into different services, and outreach and other types of things that are badly needed. Uh, and also to look at things, you know, when it comes to Handyvan. Handyvan is, is a service that is vitally important. It increases 5% every single year in terms of its usage, but they have the same amount of staff. And I think, you know, if there's money that we can go after from the federal side or different types of funding structures, um, it's important. And, you know, that and combined with everything else that's going on, I think that that's something we have to take a hard look at because there's some people who don't want change or some people who don't want, you know, different things being built. But when we look at what's going to be needed for the community, I think those are the things that are important. Well, now going back to uh, the handy van, um, how do we, and I say we as a collective, how do we access more funds for handy van? What, how, how is that funded? So there are some pro, uh, there are some programs that I understand on, on, the, on the federal side, but there's also you know they're, they're heavily subsidized. Um, there there is no profit into it, but it's a it's a public service. And there's sometimes where yeah, I'm just... it's, it's a public service and there is no profit in it, but it's something that we badly need and it is important to the community. So it's just like, for example, I take the example of like a post office like in Waimanalo. It's never going to make a profit, but it's something that's there for the community and, and part of the services that government provides. Um, and we have to look at it in, in that standpoint. Now, if there's other money on the table that's available that you can be aware of, or there's grants or other things, great. Um, if there's other ways that we can get more of that type of services, I, I don't see any problem with trying to look at those things. It's always trying to look at something new, seeing if it was done before, it was every you know, impediments or whatnot. What do we do to, to make sure that those impediments are not there? Or maybe there are impediments that are there that we may have to look at changing legislation. So all those types of things I think are important as we look at this, because like you're saying, we have a silver tsunami and as that grows, there's gonna be different need for services 
And we want to make sure that the more the people who are part of the different services get the services that they need, uh, that they could qualify for, so that that's one less person that's on the street, that's one less person that, you know, we're, that doesn't have the housing or one extra person that, you know, it just, it's there. I, I see it all the time and, and it breaks my heart. I see those people who are on there. I've seen a lot of seniors. Um, and I know that proper affordable housing needs to be built, and that's one of the only things that we need to do in order to make sure that that happens so that we have people so that they can live out their lives uh, you know, in, in a most dignified uh, manner. Speaking of, speaking of housing, now, I am, I'm not going to pretend that I know your neighborhood because I don't. However, what I do know about that area is that there are a lot of empty buildings because it used to be an industrial area. Is there any way to convert those buildings into livable spaces? So I think one of the things we have to look at, and it's not dodging your question, but because, you know, for example, we have issues with some of the, the, the industrial waste from before is to, how do we go ahead and make that livable? Is that even possible with the EISs? And also um, have the conversation so people understand, you know, what is true affordable housing? So I think, you know, in, in, with all those things working together, that's something that's first. But I think the key is, is that is that place livable first? You know, even if we look at for sea rise, uh, sea level rise, is that a, a, an area that we're confident that's going to be livable in the next, you know, 50 years or so, aside from just the seniors there, but, you know, the other uses as it goes. So all those types of questions need to be asked if they haven't been asked already. The second thing I think about it, too, again, is that affordability. Because if we have seniors on fixed income, what can we do about that? And again, if we look at it from the standpoint of, well, if a person's on the street, just going to the emergency room for whatever the reason is, $1,850 for an ambulance ride, $3,500 for emergency room care. And if we keep pounding away at that and, and having people understand that that's the cost, um, regardless of what we do, then I think that from there will elicit better responses and better solutions that are coming up. I, I, yes, it seems, you know, they tell you, oh, well, if you fall, call 911, do this 911, but no one ever looks at the cost of calling 911. I don't want to dissuade anybody from mm -hmm. calling 911 if you're having a stroke, yes, absolutely. But some of the little things that people call for when you look at the cost, and we as taxpayers pay that when a person can't. So, so you know, since, so, you're since you're talking about that, and especially when you're talking about preventive care, one of the things that comes to mind is where there's programs where seniors can have, you know, uh, different types of railings put inside for their bathrooms and whatnot, so that, you know, that at least a safety precaution against a fall. Um, I can't think of it right offhand, but I know that those programs do exist. And those little things like that, just for seniors to be aware of, should they qualify, I think are very important. What, now, what is, uh, what, what is the, quote, age of being a senior? Uh, AARP accepts you at 50. Uh, is, what is the state saying as a senior? I believe it's age 62, I think, is what, what, what a senior is, or that attain age. So you 62. have to wait from... <laughs> You have to wait until you're 62. Well, you know, most people in Hawaii are healthier than, than most states. So so at 62 is the, quote, amount so, that is so qualified as a senior. There's different cohorts of, 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 you know, different groups that are more healthier than others. But I think that, you know, we, we can look at that from, a, you know, from a different standpoint. There's some who are from, you know, different groups that are much healthier if they have the, the means to, to exercise and have the time. And then we have those from other groups that, you know, that's not afforded that much. And they're, you know, predisposed to, you know, say, you know, dialysis or anything else um, that we just have to be cautious about. Now, dialysis is terribly expensive. Oh, my goodness. Oh, I was reading about, you know, what is $10,000 a week or a month or what like that? Who has that kind of money? You know? Because once you start dialysis, that's forever. You don't get to say, well, I'm just going to do it this one time. How, how do we pay for that? So one of the things that uh, is important, and I didn't, you know, uh, is bringing up the census, for example. And 
because, okay. and, and the reason I bring that up is because we, in about 2016, we got about a, a billion dollars from the federal government uh, for our, our, our Medicare system. And I would say a lot of that went into services like dialysis. Um, also, too, like if you're part of a union, um, some of those services are provided. Uh, regardless of the union, I can't, you know, it, they're all different specific type of things. But just knowing that the importance of something like that, you know, we got over $3.4 billion in 2016 from the federal government, and, uh, and sorry, 2.7, and about a billion dollars went into Medicare. So that shows you the importance of what that is. And as our senior population grows, we're going to need more of that. And, and, you know, we've talked about the census before, and I know you had people on the show about it, but the more that we have people counted, the more that those types of federal dollars can go to different programs like that. And that's why it's very important. So we, I, I yes, we have done a regular series with the uh, census people. But again, I would like for you to address the dollars and cents. What, by an accurate count, how much do we get? How much does the state of Hawaii get if we get an accurate account? I know we were short on the account 10 years ago, but this is only every 10 years, so we need to get it right. So tell me in terms of dollars and cents, what is it that we didn't get and what can we get if the count is correct? So it was in 2000, I believe it was uh, 2010, uh, 2010, yes, that was the next, the one that we had. Um, there was a study that was conducted to show that, you know, for every person that wasn't counted, we lost about $1,600. So uh, just taking that into today's money, it was about $1,800. However, there was a study conducted by EBID um, from the state of Hawaii, Department of Economic Development and Tourism, that has shown that for every person that we don't count is about $2,600. So you take twenty six hundred dollars, times it by, you know, however much you, you know. We, we've have, you know, in my area, I'm working really hard to make sure that every person's counted because we've had very low counts, uh, about thirty percent or so. When our average for the state is close to about seventy five or better, um, that's just loss money. That's just loss. So the more that we have a count, the better that we have the ability to serve our communities uh, and, and qualify for federal money that we would not have. And if we reach certain, you know, population benchmarks then you know, there is other types of services that we could qualify for. So I'm looking at this saying, okay, well, we have, you know, uh, just doing the simple math from before, I think we lost about $95 million or more. We just, you know, just because we didn't have people who, who did the census. So the more people that do the census, the more that participate. Um, and there's a trust in line with that. So, you know, there's people who the census on their side, they're trying to make sure that they're getting people from the community so they can go ahead. So there's trust that's, you know, uh, afforded to so that if a person comes from that community, there's more trust that, that, that comes that that person who's there is not just there to, you know, do the bidding of, of whatever law enforcement agency that there is, but getting the proper count so that we have the proper amount of resources that we can go after. Uh, speaking of resources, um, we've been talking about the silver tsunami about seniors, of which I am one. How Ever, some of that money goes into school lunches. So talk about those other little things for people other than seniors and Medicare. So we're going to go on a little tangent that, here. You're absolutely right. That depends right. on the count. It does depend on the count. There's other types of services from, from Head Start to, you know, different types of uh, the lunch programs. Um, and there's other types of qualifying uh, types of things that people have to go through. However, all that is part of a larger count, if you will, that comes from the federal government from the census goes to, you know, the Department of Health and Human Services and, and there are other types of departments to determine in a certain formula how much an area gets. But why that's important too from the senior side is because if we're spending money, for example, on something that could have been from somewhere else, then that's just lost money. So the more that we can be creative and saying, okay, well, if we're making sure that we're having this count, um, then the money that we had for something that wasn't fully dedicated for this can go to somewhere else or, or even you know, additional funds. I think that's very important to look at. And just that having that creative mind, you know, looking at, at these different things and not just seeing it in its own little box, not just seniors, not just you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, children or parents or whatever it is, but the larger part of the component of the community of how everybody benefits from these different services. 
the more that people are within services that we can provide funding for, then there will be money and other things left on the table for other types of programs and other types of services. So I think that's something that's very vital and important. I, you know, uh, one of the ones that come to mind is definitely streets. You know, um, money to, to make sure that streets are paved, ma making sure that we have additional personnel if we're able to, to help clean the roads and so on and so forth. So all these things, and police also for that matter, we've had issues you know, with, with public safety. So the more that we can show the, the count of the population, uh, the greater their chances we have for this different type of federal fund um, that we were as a state or as a county paying for that could be paid for with another different uh, coffer, if you will. Well, um, now, uh, what we have talked about with the census of the different languages, do you have several different languages in your neighborhood? I do. So, and um, are, go ahead. No, go ahead, do you Marcia. have different, so many different languages? I Let's start there. So, you know, one of the most popular ones that's on there is Tagalog. Um, I have um, Chukis and I have uh, Marshallese, and I know I'm missing a, a couple that's in there, um, Chinese as well. But getting that proper count, I know I have other uh, languages in there, but the more that we can show that level of uh, inclusivity to that communities, uh, the more we have a larger count, and the more that we can get people who you know, that we can get the word out saying, hey, the census are looking for people um, from different various types of communities who can speak different languages. The more, like, we, we talk about that trust that the community has uh, in those individuals because they come from the community. It's not somebody who's just coming from the outside. So hopefully there's, there's a little bit more of an inherent trust from that as opposed to just somebody who's, you know, hi, I'm from the census, here's my ID card. You know, somebody who's from the community that there's trust that, that, that's already there. I think that that speaks so monumentally. What, so what you're saying, what you're saying is the more people that apply for the job with the census from that community, the more trust there is. Is that what you're saying? Absolutely. And I encourage people who are in those different communities, go on there, go to uh, on the census website. I believe it's census.gov. And there's an area to apply. Um, if you can Google it, there's a jobs on there. It says census jobs. And if it's for Hawaii. So uh, just, you know, if, if you're able to, take advantage of that. And there's also for people who qualify and if they're, you know, uh, at a certain income threshold that they can still retain the services that they have uh, and, and different types of uh, benefits because it's only temporary um, while they're working for the census. So they're not going to lose that uh, while they're working for the census or even afterward. So, yes, it's just so that if they're already employed, it's not going to hurt them working because it is part time. So I, I'm, I'm paraphrasing here, but I, you should also check with the census as well. I'm just saying that there's, uh, there is something where it's afforded where persons who are low income or considered low income have the ability to um, sign up if they are selected for the job, um, that they're not going to lose their benefits because the, the job is temporary. It's going to be paying um, oh. above you know, what would be minimum wage or whatever it is, or whatever that threshold is, I see. but they're not going to lose mm -hmm. their, their different services. Oh, great. All right, so it is uh, 2020census.gov, I think, I hope. If, I hope if, if right. it's not, just Google it and <laughs> try was... to find it. I'm sure it's there too. Yes, <laughs> we, do, we want everybody counted in every language. And that way, we're back to the seniors and the, the silver tsunami. Absolutely. Those seniors can also apply for these jobs. Yes, they can. So it doesn't have to be just youngsters, and uh, especially, yeah. No, well, I think it it's helps too, with because even if they're, you know, let's say, you know, a retirement home or they're in different types of senior housing, you know, I think that's something that I think they could do or get more people to participate in them because it's not just you know U.S. citizens; it's every person who's here at the time who has an impact on our infrastructure and different services. So that that's all very important. So that's a good idea. I like that. Maybe we'll talk to the census people about recruiting from senior homes, having people that live there work there. You know, that's a great idea. Thank you. Oh, thank, thank you, you. Marcia. And it's always a pleasure to spend this time with you. And we have run out of time, but it always goes very fast. Again, thank you, Robert. Eric, 
and good luck with the move and we'll see you next time. Thank Aloha. You. Uh -huh.